hear me okay? Uh, all right, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this last uh, lecture on this topic of celestial holography and celestial amplitudes. So today uh, the plan is to, um, now that we have introduced all that we needed to talk about celestial amplitudes, to show you uh, how there are real two-dimensional currents that appear uh, in celestial conformal field theory. And we will uh, discuss uh, also some features of celestial operator product expansions. And then I will try to give you some broad overview of this program of celestial of holography, what, what we have achieved so far, which are the big questions that are still open, um, and eventually what, uh, what uh, is the big picture uh, that we want to achieve. So, as usual, I will start with a um, brief recap of the main uh, message of last lecture. So the, in yesterday, we defined what was a, a celestial amplitude. And for this, uh, we represented massless particles. So a massless particle crossed the celestial sphere, yes at a point, then a z-bar, and carrying an energy omega, and eventually, uh, and also a helicity if it's spinning particle. Um, so these um, massless scatterers are represented in celestial holography by celestial operators denoted by a curly O, which carry um, a conformal dimension delta and a 2D spin. So the 2D spin is identified simply with the bulk for the helicity of the particle. This operator is inserted at some point z and z bar. And delta, importantly, plays the role of the conformal dimension. Which can be written as the sum of the usual safety language left and right weights, while the spin is the difference of h and h bar. And this mapping, this celestial mapping from a massless scattering to an operator on the sphere was performed uh, via this integral transform, which is a Malin transform. So if you have a, a scattering of n particles, we will perform a Malin integral over each leg. So for each particle of energy omega i, we will trade it for this uh, complex, a priori complex number, delta. So this is a scattering amplitude written in a, this convenient uh, boost basis. And in celestial holography, we want to uh, see to which extent we can interpret and what this interpretation will tell us about the holographic structure of quantum gravity and the boundary of flat space. We can interpret this uh, scattering in this boost basis as a, a correlation function involving these celestial operators on this putative, uh, yet to be discovered, conform, uh, celestial conformal field theory. Where, so here I recall that the whole point of this was to make this uh, SL2C transformation manifest. Good. So now I will uh, turn to the so-called uh, currents in celestial CFT. So these currents will appear when we take 
specific integer values of the conformal dimension delta. And we'll call them a conformally soft operator. So indeed, uh, in, the, in the second lecture, we saw all these nice equivalences between um, wire identity associated to, to asymptotic symmetries and sub-theorems. Uh, so we, we saw that, call that the soft, I will mostly present current for gravity, but we, we, I sketch also the story for the soft photon theorem. So the soft graviton theorem can be interpreted as some insertion of, um, of a current. And now the question I want to, to ask is, you see where we had the soft graviton or soft photon, we're taking the, omega, uh, uh, the energy omega to zero. But now when in celestial holography, we do no longer have energies to talk about because we have traded energies for conformal dimensions. So what does it mean in the celestial basis to be soft? Well, what uh, people have came to realize is that there is an analogous, or if you want a dual uh, uh, formulation of uh, softness, but now in the celestial basis, the statement of a particle to be soft so before we have energy, energetically soft particle, the amount to take on the energy to zero. Now we will be calling in celestial holography a particle which is soft in the conformal sense as a conformally soft particle. And the conformally soft particle or soft operator will be um, a uh, celestial object which, for which the conformal dimension take specific integer values. So these objects will play the role of these two-dimensional celestial currents. So which values of delta do we have to look at? Well, today I want to present you uh, two specific values when delta is equal to one and delta is equal to zero. Um, because as you will see, these two quantities will uh, give, give us these, the two currents that we have insisted on in the beginning of the lecture, which are the so-called super translation current and the uh, famous uh, celestial stress tensor. So let's start with uh, the first object, the super translation current. So which value of delta do we have to consider? Well, if you remember uh, yesterday, I presented for you these conformal primary wave functions. And if you remember, there was a primary that uh, was becoming a pure diffeomorphism for, for delta equal to one. And I told you, watch out, when uh, these guys are large gauge transformation, we should not uh, neglect this, these terms and subtlety uh, should arise for these values. And indeed, so the super translation current in celestial CFT is uh, as an object, a celestial object which has conformal dimension equal to one. So remember, there was the conformal primary wave function that was a pure diffeo for this value. So naturally, since all this business is related to asymptotic symmetries and large gauge transformations, uh, it's natural that something uh, funny happens for this value. And the super translation current 
more precisely. So, you so if you don't remember what it was, remember that we have these um, in the usual momentum basis. Let me recall what this was. We had the, the wired identity associated to support translation. Our translation symmetry. Where we had a statement that this matrix commutes with the charge associated to this symmetry. I think I've written that in this uh, chart when we had different columns that this wired identity, if you split it into piece, you put the, the left on this left-hand side of this equality, is equivalent to inserting this, this P here, the S matrix, and inserting this object gives you the soft leading, soft Weinberg, soft graviton theorem. And if you remember, we had this sort of expression. And I told you this looks like a U1 Kachmudi current, but deformed with this energy omega. And now we will write this not in the, so here I, I'm still in the, the old basis, the momentum basis. Now we'll write this in the celestial basis. And we'll see that inserting this, this object uh, makes some funny, has some f funny feature in celestial CFT. So this P inserts. Uh, a subgraviton. So that was the, uh, the old basis. Now in the celestial basis, this object will be obtained by taking this so-called conformally soft limit, namely when delta takes some specific values. And actually, it will not be qu quite exactly the celestial operator when delta goes to one. So here, there is a delta minus one factor. This is just a way to, to put the pole up rather than down. Is that, that coming from omega to zero. Here, it will correspond to delta equal to one. There are different definitions for this, but here I've, I've let it the delta equal to one in this definition. So you can see that it's not a just taking delta equal to one of a celestial operator of a spin two, because I'm, I'm talking about gravity uh, operator, but rather I have to take a descendant uh, in the CFT language, so derivative respect to a Z bar of this operator. And so we can count the weights of this object. So if delta equal one and j, the helicity is two, um, I can equivalently write in maybe more familiar form in terms of h and h bar. So h is half of the sum of these things. h bar is half, half of this, of the difference. So the weight of a delta equal one, j equal zero, uh, celestial uh, operator will be denoted by h comma h bar. So here, delta is one, j is two, so one half of one plus two, this equals to three half, and one half of delta minus j give us minus a half. But you see this is not p, these are not the, the ways of p, p is a descendant of this object. So the weights of P so are given by the weights of this object. But now, since I'm taking one Z bar derivative, this will increase H bar by one. So this is just the descendancy. 
So the weight of this per translation current is this uh, equal to three half, one half. So this is something that we are not familiar with in, in, in usual CFT. Typically, we talk about catch Moody currents, which have one comma zero weight, or stress tensor, which are two comma zero. So in particular, this P is not holomorphic, so it's a bit an abuse of language to say it's a current, but yet we will keep calling it like that. And again, uh, now we can rewrite this uh, expression in form of a celestial correlation function. So in now in a celestial basis, inserting this super translation current, which I recall is in one to one with expressing Weinberg subgraviton theorem. Now I'm replacing all my in and out state in terms of uh, celestial operator, so let me use this shorthand notation. Okay, here we'll stand for, we'll carry all the labels of a celestial operator, <coughs> of a celestial operator. So, if I insert this current into a celestial, now interpreted as, as a correlation function on the celestial CFT, I will just obtain that. So I'm just doing a N Mellin transform. You can check this very easily. This is just by definition of, of what is a celestial operator as a Mellin transform of the plane wave. But now you see that before I had this, in the momentum basis, I had this omega here in the numerator. Now when I do the Mellin transform, which is here, because I have a, a delta minus one uh, upstairs, if I, if I want to rewrite this in the operator as a, uh, as a correlation function in the celestial basis, you will see that this is just nothing but um, the correlation function, but now where the conformal dimension of the operator k is shifted by one. This, so the shift by one is just because we had an omega here, and when you look at the Mellin transform, if you multiply this by omega, it's the same as shifting delta to one in the formula. So again, here we see that uh, the action of the super translation current, very importantly, shifts the conformal dimension of the operator in the celestial CFC, which again is something that we don't usually encounter in uh, what people call vanilla uh, 2D CFT. But this is something that we have to deal with in celestial holography. Uh, this is just a consequence of super translation symmetry. We know that the symmetry is there. So we know that whatever is the dual uh, theory of quantum gravity in flat space written in this basis, it will have to obey this infinite amount of, uh, of relationship implied by super translation symmetry. So this, you see that already just by recasting what we know from the momentum basis to the celestial basis, we already see some features appearing uh, in, in the dual theory that, that is starting to tell us in which way this theory is different or familiar to the one we are, we are used to. Is there a question, are there any questions at this stage on, the, on this current? Okay, if not, now let's talk about something a little bit uh, less uh, weird, which is the other current, which is very important, is this stress tensor in celestial CFT. So this is really, as I said before, the discovery that we had super rotation symmetry and then that this super rotation symmetry were enhancing the 
global conformal transformation to the full Vera Zorro uh, group led people to be very excited and start to dig for more celestial or more CFT2 structure. So how can we get this stress tensor? So celestial stress tensor. So this, this uh, stress tensor was first ob obtained in the momentum basis by the work of Andy Strominger and others uh, from really a reverse engineering from the subleading soft graviton theorem. And then they guessed what was the form of an object that they needed to insert in this matrix so that it's consistent with the, the symmetry. But in the momentum basis, uh, uh, and in terms of the gravitational solution space, you remember this boundary expansion I showed you before with the news, the shear. This object is really weird. It's a non-local expression. It's an integral over all null infinity of the, some derivative of the new tensor. It's a, it's, it was a really funny object that they really didn't understand why, uh, how to obtain this in a natural way. And, um, and now we can see this object uh, arising more naturally uh, as, again, a conformally soft operator. But there is a subtlety. The subtlety is that this stress tensor involves a so-called shadow transform in, uh, in CFT. So I, I'm not sure that this notion is familiar, so let me uh, define what is a shadow transform first. And this shadow transform actually is ubiquitous in the celestial holography program. It shows up. It leads to many confusions. Uh, so it's important to discuss it. It's not just a technical point. It's really actually uh, important in understanding what is the spectrum of celestial CFT. Do we do we have to include all shadow modes or not? There are a lot of debate in the current literature on that. So if you start with um, the shadow transform of a primary, to see primary of, of weights uh, H and H bar. So again, H and H bar can, can be traded for delta and J. So what is it? So define like so. Let me write it and then I explain. So the shadow transform will change the conformal dimension, but will return you still um, a primary. It also flips the 2D spin. Sorry, Laura, is yes. a primary or quasi-primary? It's a quasi-primary. Quasi-primary, yes. yes. Minus delta. So that's the definition of the shadow. It's an integral over your y and y bar. So there are some normalization here that depends on, the, depends on the convention. You can find this definition in paper by Osborne or Osborne and Dolan, for instance. So you start with the quasi-primary of weight of this uh, dimension, delta and j. You do this integral, which depends on which kind of operator you start from. You will have different uh, powers here in the z minus y and z bar minus y bar. And this will return to you another primary, but now with different uh, dimension. Now its dimension will be two minus delta. 
So if I were to uh, write this in terms of h and h bar, you can see that if you start with something, if you start with a primer of these weights, after a shadow, you will have something with one minus h and one minus h bar. So now it, it was realized that the stress tensor of celestial uh, CFT arises as the shadow transform of, of an operator of weights delta equals zero. So I will call a uh, stress tensor. Indeed, if I start with something which has weight zero, the shadow transform will give me something which has dimension two minus zero, so two. So this is the stress tensor in celestial CFT. Again, there is this delta here. Let me write it up front so that the limit when delta goes to zero of delta times this expression. Uh, and this you can recognize as the, if you take delta equal zero in this formula, you will see that this power become, this exponent become four and this is equal to zero. If I start with a, uh, a spin equal to minus two, it will flip the spin. So it return me something that has h equal two and h bar equal zero, which is the dimension we expect from uh, a stress tensor. So it's the shadow of delta equal zero primary. So again, the realization that this uh, was a stress tensor is really, is, is long. It, 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 it came pieces by pieces by for first this realizing this of uh, subleading soft graviton theorems, a reverse engineer, and then people say, okay, but there is a basis. Actually, this is what motivated to look at this uh, celestial basis, was to look for a basis where the action of this T was, was uh, diagonalized. So it's a bit, um, uh, was built, built on from all that. And here I'm just giving it to you, so you might think, well, where does it, where does it come from? How could I have guessed it? Well, just looking at the dimension, you can guess, but uh, this shadow transform is it's kind of tricky and it took some time to understand uh, why it has to be like so. But so the, the main property I want to emphasize on is that indeed, remarkably, we have an object that obeys the wild identity of a stress tensor in a conventional in a conventional CFT tool. Writing down here for you. Can you, you can find in any CFT book. <clears throat> okay, so this is the world identity of a 2D stress tensor as it should be. Okay. So this equation was checked explicitly from, uh, from amplitude people. So in, in particular, uh, Thomas Taylor and Stefan Stieberger, they computed a lot of um, celestial amplitude, starting from the well-known uh, formula that, from, that they have basically invented themselves. So um, they have uh, checked this formula, checked explicitly, uh, 
Uh, so by brute force, so you start with the momentum basis amplitude, and then you do a bunch of Mellin transform. So they looked at first Einstein Young Mills amplitude. So with the um, N gauge bosons and one graviton. So it was really Fotopoulos and Taylor for this, but then people have been looking at many extension of these sort of facts. So this was really checked by starting with the momentum space young, uh, Einstein Young Mills. You do the, the Millin transform, you do a shadow transform, and then you take the limit delta goes to zero and you land explicitly on this sort of right-hand side. So what it shows is that if you represent uh, gauge bosons by celestial operators, it proved that these celestial uh, CFT operators are indeed full Virazora primary fields because this is nothing but the definition uh, of how a Virazora primary uh, should, if you want, transform. So this is uh, really, uh, in one-to-one. -one. So this sort of check proved that PCFT operators. So be, be, before you see, I was talking about mostly the global part. I was telling you about this L2C transformation, Mobius transformation. But now you see that when we are coupled to gravity, the uh, presence of super rotations uh, in, encoded by this stress tensor is enhancing the group uh, so that the operators are now primaries under the full uh, local group, namely uh, they are Verazoro primaries. At least we are very happy because this is something we know very well how to deal with in usual CFT2. So we might hope that because of that, we can exploit the techniques of 2D CFT into this uh, celestial holography program to sort of bootstrap uh, out, of, out, of the, out of the blue the, the celestial theory. Is there any question on that? Yes. On the bulk, the computation are done at three level, or they are also low computation? Right, so the, 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 this, this work I was mentioning was done at three level. Um, uh, the, the extension to loop corrections is much less uh, understood. There have been some papers on that, but most of, most of the things I'm, I'm going to mention are on three level. But yeah. we expect that at loop level, there is a, it respect exactly the same uh, Virazo. So, okay, so what happens is that the um, bleeding uh, soft graviton theorem has correction at loop level, but these corrections are one loop exact. So it is correct, it's corrected at, at a tree level, it's exact in all order of perturbation theory. One loop gets correction, but then there is no more correction. And these corrections are, um, if you want to re recast this soft theorem as wide entity of an object, you have to include another contribution to this T here. I'm not introduced, uh, entering into this detail, but um, there, is, there is a shifted uh, stress tensor which it's very subtle, it has to do with some vacuum structure of gravity. Um, that's, that's a very good question, it's, but it's under an investigation uh, right now. But, but yes, there is a, a correction to this T. But it's still a, a 2,0 thing, but there are some fine, fine details to okay, take thank into you. account. I didn't quite understand why we care that it, this T was shadow transform of a delta equals zero operator. 
Um, Why do we use it? We care because that's the only way you can, you can get it somehow. If you, um, if you um, let's see, how can I explain it? So, yeah. Actually, there is an extent to which um, all objects that are all the currents are actually, if you want to map them to the, to the gravitational phase space, they're actually naturally related not to the celestial operator, but to the shadow operators, all of them. Turns out that I didn't have to talk about that here because uh, the shadow of a delta equal one mode has also delta equal one. But actually, and there is some degeneracy because of that. But actually, there is a pretty uh, funny aspect that if you want to translate with the gravity phase space, um, the, naturally what happens, they are so, somehow all shadow objects. But uh, this is why we care. The, the reason why we care is because uh, this is uh, somehow uh, what it is. <laughs> and if you don't look, if you don't have this idea of allowing for a shadow transformation, you would not see this object in the first place. And it's pretty non-trivial, you know, that there is something of stress tensor in the boundary of that space. I mean, why, why would it be so? Uh, I, I have not understood this. This is a specific operator, uh, the one from which you construct T, or is a generic operator with delta equal to zero and j equal to minus two? Uh, this, this, this one. Yes. This O. So yes, this this is a generic in the sense that it represents uh, the insertion of a massless graviton on the sphere with spin equal to to uh, here to two or minus two. I have an analogous T bar, of course, with if I take J equal plus two. Okay, but, but so, uh, yeah. so, so suppose you have more than one operator with uh, with delta equal to zero and J equal to minus two. How do you know how to to generate T, the stress energy tensor? Um, you mean if I have the generacy, let's say, no? Yeah. So all I mean all um, yeah. So basically, what different differentiate these operators will will be uh, what you differentiate their null momenta, for instance. And their null momenta carries a given energy uh, and a point on the sphere. This is the only thing I know when I'm looking at the celestial sphere. And, and so what I'm saying is that the stress tensor is related to the operator which insert a conformally soft operator because delta takes spe some specific values. But secretly, actually, you can see that uh, it's, it's equivalent to inserting a soft, soft graviton. So basically go, taking omega to zero is something I'm just saying, I'm just stating to you, but um, taking omega, omega to zero, you can see that from the structure of the amplitude, we'll select some poles when delta takes some in integer values. So apart from that, uh, does it answer your question? W w so, sorry, would I say that the uniqueness of gravity, the fact that there is only one spin two massless particle, so if you wish assuming that in the S matrix, which is a very reasonable, then the, in the, the celestial safety has to have a unique, there can be any degeneracy of this operator. So it has to be unique. Okay. Otherwise you will have a two kind of gravitons and you can't have. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's a very strong constraint because uh, so this you can every time I'm writing this this uh, this relationship, you have to see this as actually an infinite amount of of, of constraint for the CFT to to obey. And 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 this is the whole uh, philosophy of this program is to try to have a bottom up approach where you derive from what you know constraints on, on coming from symmetries and 
you hope that at some point this constraint will be so strong, there will be so many of them, that it will, um, if you want, uh, if you, you will uh, uh, isolate a theory that you can identify, or at least you can identify what properties it has to obey. Vice and versa, so I will come to that when I talk about the, the, where the program stands it, but that's the, so the question was, uh, you can uh, repeat the, the question was, uh, <laughs> you, you should both uh, infer property of the CFT by what you know that credit should be like, uh, there is just one graviton, so that there must be just one operator with this property. Then um, understanding property of gravities uh, from, let's say, constraints that I know that there are on, on CFT, no? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the hope uh, uh, and the thing that people are actively trying to do is that now go in the vice and versa direction that you were mentioning. Namely, can we cook up some theory, a celestial theory, from which we can infer new uh, new new things that we didn't already know from momentum basis and all this uh, very rich literature on amplitude. And this is an extremely complicated thing to do because basically it would amount to basically have a holographic dictionary uh, full, fully fledged. Uh, so this is an outstanding question to have an intrinsic definition of celestial CFT. Okay, uh, very good, thanks for the questions. So, yes, I will, I will come back to, um, I will come back to, to these big questions of what we know about celestial safety so far, what we don't know. So, I have a few minutes left before I, Go into the last section of this summary and outlook. Just the last thing that I would like to tell you is that there is a way to access the operator product expansions or OPEs in Celestial CFT. No, it's not 3.2 at all. The operator product expansions. by looking at uh, collinear divergences in the 4D uh, momentum space. So, the statement, and you will, you will see why this is the case, collinear divergences of the 4D momentum usual stuff. So again, it's really bottom up. We'll start with all this uh, beautiful formula people have been developing in scattering amplitudes and see what it infer we can deduce in the celestial CFT. So these things extract for us the singularities celestial OPEs and there is a very stupid reason for that, that you remember when we parametrize the momentum of the particle like so, at going momentum, if you take the product of two mom momenta, P1 with P2, just compute that, and you find that it's given by omega one, omega two, times z one, two, z bar one, two, or z one, two, the usual difference between z one and z two, and similarly. So in other words, a collinear limit, when these two, the two momenta become parallel, um, selects, well, if you have a collinear diverge, divergence, it will extract the, the, the pole when Z1 approaches uh, Z2. So basically, 
In there. T1, R2, T2 is the same as taking Z1 close to P2. So, in other words, you have a scattering. You take these two momenta to be linear. These correspond in the celestial sphere to look at Z1 approaching Z2. Okay? And then you have other, so you just this, take these two points to be close to each other. And then you have other insurgents. So this very uh, simple kinematic uh, observation uh, can also be used to now extract OPEs in celestial CFT. Um, so I'm a bit running out of time here. So if you have questions about that, you can ask me in the discussion session. But let me just uh, mention a few results on that. So if you look at graviton, want to derive graviton OPEs, you can do so. Uh, let's take for simplicity two positive helicity graviton. So these are represented by two operators with j equal plus two. They can depend, have each they carry a conformal dimension. So these, the, the computation has been done in this paper. I want to look at so they are basically um, two ways to derive uh, the OPE that I'm going to write down. The first method is brute force, namely you just you just uh, do your Mellin transform and you do your collinear limits, and you can compute it. So method one is. First, namely, star for momentum uh, amplitudes, look at collinear divergences, there are formulas for that, do the melin, do the collinear limit, and you will extract this structure. So this has been computed. If you have mixed helicity, it's a bit more tricky. And now people, start to know how to deal with things. So this is the OPE you get, where beta is the earlier beta function. The product of gamma. So this is a, a, a computation you can do. And this, this second method, which is a bit uh, uh, more cute, is to just, just use symmetries. So that's, that's one of the very great thing uh, of these infinite dimensional symmetries, that they are so powerful that you can, they fully constrain the OPE coefficient. So you can actually don't do any computation, but just if you remember that you have uh, translation invariance and uh, the constraint implied by uh, the leading soft graviton theorem, you can see that the symmetries, actually you, a little asterisk, you also have to know about the sub-leadings sub of graviton theorem I didn't talk about. 
But the main message I want to convey is that the symmetries, symmetry constraints, so you don't have to do this computation. They are powerful enough. So as to, um, they actually imply some sort of recursion relations on, OP, on the OPE coefficients. Before you knew that it was a, a lower beta function. So, uh -huh. so as to imply recursion on the OPE co coefficient. actually to uniquely determine, determine the OP coefficient. So the symmetry you need in this case, you need translation invariance, you need the leading subgraviton theorem. The subleading subgraviton theorem doesn't impose any constraint because by definition we are working in this uh, SL2C uh, well, basis, so this is already implemented. And you also need the sub-subleading subgraviton theorem that I didn't talk about. So you can derive this, you can derive gluon OPs, you can uh, compute all sorts of things. And before I go to the summary, let me mention some, um, some uh, comments about which is related to, to this OP and these currents and it's the most more recent uh, literature. But with that, you, you almost, we have almost co covered the main features of celestial amplitudes. It's this observation that, so, so that delta equal one and zero up to what do you this, well, this shadow transform is conformally sublimit lead to celestial currents. But our recent work have been showing that there seems to be an infinite tower of currents where delta is running over all negative integers. So, um, and very recently, Strominger uh, managed to show that if you look at this very complicated structure in, 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 uh, implied by uh, these infinite hours of, of current, you can nicely, by a clever uh, field redefinition, <coughs> you can nicely uh, recast this uh, constraint in terms of a single uh, simple algebra, well, not so simple, but which uh, is the so-called W1 plus infinity algebra. Um, which is an algebra which appears in very different contexts in, in, uh, in higher spin, but also in twister space. So now there have been this new interplay between celestial uh, holog holography and, and, twister, and twister techniques. So again, this is a, a nice uh, combination of different communities working uh, now uh, together. So unfortunately, I don't have much time to, to talk about that in, in more details. And um, I will just, I think, go to, to the summary of what we have learned in these in this, uh, four lectures and what are the main questions that remain to be answered in celestial holography. So summary and outlook.
So what we have seen, and I, have, I hope I've tried to convince you that you remember that the infrastructure of gravity in asymptotic flat space time is very rich, very special. We have this infinite tower of symmetries of conservation laws that um, any consistent quantum, pre -theory, uh, quantum gravity uh, theory should, should obey. They have an infinite amount of symmetries uh, which are constrained, constraining it. And celestial holography, the main point of this program is to make the full use as much as we can use of all these symmetries uh, to, constra to constrain um, the holographic dual of 4D gravity. So which again, the main claim or the main thing we are looking after the theory of quantum gravity in flat space time in four dimension, which I recall uh, described the real world to some extent, could be described as a celestial 2D CFT, depending on the celestial sphere. And this, uh, there is this promising uh, dictionary which involves which involve this Malin transform integral, which makes this uh, SL2C transformation manifest. So we have to summarize and to finish, we have a similar feature that we are used to in usual CFT2. So the whole point is to understand what is, what is the celestial CFT2? Does, does it make sense as a theory? Uh, how can we push this and how can we constrain this, this, this quantity? And this, uh, this right hand side here. So let me mention some uh, nice feature that we have seen. So, the main uh, resemblance we've seen compared to usual CFT2 is that we have, we have 2D currents, we have a catch Moody currents, we have a st stress tensor, which is far from obvious. Um, we have primary operators. We have also the descendants and so on and so forth. But they're also very different. This theory is also very weird to some, to many regards. Uh, so let me mention some uh, funny feature we have seen. So first we had this, the fact that this conformal dimension of this primary is a, a priori any uh, continuous uh, and complex uh, spectrum. We have seen that there is a super, tr the super translation symmetry give an infinite amount of concern that we are not to and uh, not used to in usual CFT because they uh, shift the weights of the operators by one as I've written in the formula before shift the conformal dimension by one and there are other things uh, I just uh, throwing at you, but I had some question before uh, regarding that. So it's maybe a time to answer. So for instance, if you look at the four point function of um, in the celestial basis, you will see that it implies that the, the cross ratio has to be real and all the point actually forced to be inserted. This is just a constraint from kinematics. They are forced to lie on the, on, on the equator of the celestial sphere. It's just a constraint from kinematic. And this is uh, something that we don't have in a usual local unitary uh, 2D CFT. There are also weird things happening with the conformal block expansion. Uh, that, uh, that people are trying to treat uh, 
the best as possible, but this is also something that is not so uh, fully understood so far. And in the last minute, so let me, me tell you what are the big questions that are left to answer. Before I, I take all questions you might have. So, so of course, this is a very broad topic. I didn't have to cover all aspects of it. And this was biased on my own personal uh, <laughs> taste. But one question you could, you could have is, what is the relationship? Or is there some way to, to use what we know from ADS CFT? How, how could we relate um, the celestial correlators to the one of ADS? But really, celestial holography is very different from ADS CFT. So in ADS CFT, we have we have this uh, nice time-like boundary, the boundary of ADS. But if for flat space, gravity in flat space, we have this annoying uh, null boundary, and this is what all the difficulty comes about. Uh, because in ADS, what we are used to is we are used to put some reflecting Dirichlet kind of boundary condition, where we say that ADS acts like a box. But now in, in flat space time, as we have seen, we have gravitational wave escaping the boundary. So there is some leak of radiation that we have to uh, account for. So I think we have to deal, if we want to make this relationship precise, we have to understand how to deal with leaks of radiation in holography. So that's the first point. The second point we already discussed, but this amounts to say, what is a celestial CFT? Namely, can we come up with the intrinsic definition, rather than this bottom-up approach that most of the works have been following? Uh, so, or interesting definition or a list of properties, full list of properties that this theory should obey. Because so far, it was mostly bottom up from what we already knew from amplitudes. And we want a top down, we want, we want to start with the CFT and infer something we didn't already know in quantum gravity. And I think that in this regard, we are starting to do so because this nice symmetry structure that is emerging has compelled us to reconsider many aspects of, of gravity in flat space. We had to look deeper at new kinds of memory effects, new kind of observables. Um, we had to relax very much this bondi mesnerosex bond, bond expansion that I showed in the beginning. And we start to understand uh, how all these things are connected to each other. Um, so I think that we are getting there slowly. And finally, uh, I think one uh, very ambitious goal, which is actually at the core of my own research project, <coughs> is to have some sense or to eventually use this program not to constrain just uh, assembly flat uh, space time, but space time which, which contain a horizon, which have black hole inside. In the presence of a black hole, this story is way more complicated. Uh, but eventually, I think that this, this, uh, this paradigm can, um, can really learn uh, we can really learn something new uh, in terms of conservation laws, what are the global conservation laws that uh, black hole space-time have, have to obey. So before I finish, I wanted to thank you for uh, uh, coming to the lecture and for your very interested questions and comments. So thanks.